Good evening friends, I am Pastor Shine from City Harvest AG Church, Bangalore. The Gospels are central to our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. All of us who read the Gospels have questions and thank you for many who registered and sent us your questions for the seminar. I hope you will get help uh, for many of them. Let me give you an idea of how we have planned this webinar. First of all, we will be looking generally at all the four Gospels, asking several questions pertinent to the Gospels. Secondly, after a short interval, we will look specifically at the four Gospels, very briefly as our time permits. We are glad to have Pastor Jacob Cherian with us. Pastor Jacob is not a stranger. Pastor Jacob as he prefers to be called, has been the faculty of Southern Asia Bible College since 1987. He comes to us with almost 40 years of experience in preaching and teaching. After his BSc in Science, Pastor Jacob completed his Bachelor of Divinity from SABC. Later, he completed his THM at Regent College, Vancouver, Canada where he was mentored by the eminent New Testament scholar Gordon Fee. His PhD is from Princeton Theological Seminary, USA, focusing on Pauline studies. Pastor Jacob sees his main calling as that of a pastor and teacher. He has a passion to serve the church interdenominationally and a special burden for church in North India where he was born and brought up uh, and it is such a pleasure and joy to have Pastor Jacob with us. Pastor, such a joy to have you uh, for the seminar today. Thank you Pastor Shine for this privilege uh, to have this conversation. I look forward to our time together and as we have prayed, uh, I pray that many, many people who listen to our conversation today will find help to understand the Gospels more, but more importantly, we pray that the Spirit of God will help us and uh, give us that passion to follow Christ uh, with all our heart, soul, mind and strength. So thank you for this invitation. Thank you, Pastor Jacob. Uh, let us start with a simple question from the Gospels. Where did we get this English word, Gospel Pastor? I think that's a good question to ask. The English word gospel we get is from two in words that come from Old English. So we don't use those words in that way today. Uh, the first one is god or o with a, with a kind of a diacritical mark, g-o-d, which means good. And spell, which means message. Uh, of course, the Greek equivalent of that as we use it is euangelion or the good news and this word within uh, the new testament uh, when you turn to uh, let's say mark chapter 1 verse 1 it'll say archetu euangelio jesu christu the beginning of the gospel of jesus uh, christ uh, and so the word being used here is the message and the good news, the announcement that Jesus brings. Apostle Paul will use this also later on in Romans chapter 1 verses 3 to 4. But for him, the gospel is focused always on Jesus who is the son of David and the son of God. The kind of message that even Mary received uh, uh, at, uh, at the Annunciation. And so this word uh, means the message of Jesus. But by the time the second century came, the word gospel is also being used to these writings, the four writings we have. And uh, so th that is a later understanding of the word gospel for the books uh, that happened. So I hope that helps where we got our English word uh, gospel. Yeah. Thank you for that understanding on gospels, Pastor. You said the gospels are the good news and it is also considered for the four writings uh, are called as the Gospels. Okay. So if the Gospel means good news, 
then what is the good news pastor is there there is a lot of bad news all around us so what is the good news in our world that is the question so what is the good news what is the gospel i think if we ask many people within our churches the chances are they are going to say some good things they may say things like the gospel is god loves us gospel is that even though we are a sinner jesus died for us and if we believe on jesus we will have life eternal we can go to heaven etc now all these things are not wrong but this is like a photographer who is uh, videoing a a wedding let's imagine that and just when the bride or the groom are saying i do the camera goes off to some other things happening in the event you know some some other important maybe not so important uh, so sometimes i think we have missed the heart of this word good news so let me let me show this uh, maybe in appropriate places to look at a passage we may be familiar with but it, it's in isaiah isaiah 52 verse 7 says isaiah 52 7 how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news who proclaim peace who bring good tidings who proclaim salvation who say to zion your god reigns so here what we have is the people of god after the babylonian exile are so discouraged and down and the good news comes to them there's a royal announcement the the verb in the hebrew is biser and the noun is besora mm. from where we get of course the equivalent in the new testament is euangelion so th- this is referring to a royal announcement and somebody the imagination is somebody is running and coming to tell jerusalem that is down and destroyed don't give up the king is coming the your god reigns so the message of the good news is that god reigns and the people of god are waiting for the time when god will be king but when is that going to happen they are in exile and they are waiting and waiting for years and years and then comes jesus and that's what we read in mark 1 uh, 15 mark chapter 1 just the beginning the first words from the mouth of jesus from the lips of jesus as we read in the gospel of mark we read jesus comes uh, proclaiming the good news of god and for those whose ears are tuned to the scriptures the old testament this is the good news that god is going to be king yes. and so jesus says the time has come the kingdom of god has come near repent and believe the good news so the good news is that god has come as king and that's what jesus announced he was the king the kingdom has got come the kingdom of god has come now of course the expectations of people were the kingdom of god has come and i see these romans are still around how can that be and that of course we have to understand how scripture teaches kingdom of god has come has been inaugurated in the in the life of jesus the death burial resurrection ascension coming of the holy spirit the kingdom of god has been inaugurated but we still wait for the consummation the final appearance of the kingdom of god so the kingdom of righteousness justice and peace that we read in the old testament people of god were waiting for jesus says it has come so the good news yes it involves forgiveness of sins and and uh, god loves us and all that but the good news is god has come to be king the good news of the kingdom of god that is the central message of all the gospels the good news is god has come as king and that's, right. that's the central message of the gospels thank you for that wonderful explanation so now we are going to look at the five, four gospels uh, 
uh, the books we have in our Bible. Uh, we have received a number of questions uh, from you, uh, dear friends. Thank you so much for sending your questions. And uh, we are going to take a couple of questions. We cannot answer all those questions for today's uh, discussion, but some of your questions are going to be taken. And we are going, I'm going to represent you asking Pastor Jacob these questions. So, Pastor, our first question is from Bupendra Kora from Bastar District. Bupendra has a question. Uh, he wants to know what kind of writings we have in the four Gospels. And uh, what are the first-hand accounts of the disciples' manuscripts? This question is from Shaiju P. Thomas from Bangalore. What are the first-hand accounts of the disciples' manuscripts of the events written in the Gospels? And was Jesus a rabbi? Interesting question. And then we have another question from Kanyakumari, uh, Mystica Rafin from Kanyakumari. Her question is, what is the core idea or the message of the Gospels? Uh, we have put all this together. Uh, one more question, Pastor, from Tuti Korin. Uh, one Karthik T has written from Koti Korin, uh, Tuti Korin. Please give us a complete picture on the background story of the Gospels. So, Pastor, can you give us a brief overview of the Gospels? All right. Karthik, I like your question. You want a complete overview. Are you ready for a lecture of two hours? Uh, well, that won't happen. So, yes. Uh, maybe we can look at the beginning of another one of the four Gospels and one of the good places to look for to understand the nature of the Gospel. Uh, Luke, uh, the Gospel of Luke, and let us look together at uh, chapter 1 and verses 1 to 4. When we read this, we will get an idea about how the Gospels, in a sense, came to us. The other Gospel writers do not give us any preface of how they happen to write it. Interestingly, in fact, all the four Gospels are, are, are uh, anonymous. You know, the, the writers don't mention their names. So, here we are, chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Luke says, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. That's an important word, fulfillment. So, that means there were many accounts by the time Luke writes this Gospel just as they were handed down to us by those who were, from the first, were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. So this account that Luke is going to put together, he says, is based on eyewitness accounts. Luke himself is not an eyewitness. So he's drawing from eyewitness accounts. And then he says, with this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning. That's kind of the language of research. Uh, I too decided to write an orderly account for you. And when we later on look at the Gospel of Luke, we will see the kind of order he puts there. Most excellent Theophilus. That looks like an important person, maybe the sponsor who helped Luke to focus on writing, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. So, what we realize here is Luke is putting together all the resources he gets from eyewitness accounts, drawing on them, putting them and arranging them in a way that he feels is going to help his first audience, Theophilus and others, uh, to understand the gospel and that they will be sure of what they have been taught. So, the gospels should be seen as based on eyewitness accounts. They are like what we may call witness documents. They should not be seen as some kind of modern biography. For that matter, you can't write a biography of a person without their birth narrative and something about that. Look at Gospel of Mark begins with no mention of the birth of Jesus or John for that matter, in that sense. So they are ancient biographies. We need to keep that in mind and passed on from time to time. Now, this understanding, maybe as we go along, I will explain some of the other questions. One of them was, I think your question was, was Jesus a rabbi? Yes, he's called rabbi also in the Gospels by somebody. Rabbi meant a teacher. 
And so Jesus is referred to as rabbi in a couple of places, uh, but he's also referred to as some other words also. Rabbi often translated as teacher. So yes, let's go on. I hope that some of these questions will become clearer as we say, explain more about the Gospels. So Pastor, what is the core message of these four Gospels? We also have questions that naturally follows about these four Gospels because why do we have four Gospels? Uh, Viresh from Gangavati has asked this question. Why four Gospels? And then we have Richard from Dindigal. He's, he's asked, why only these four Gospels are found in the Bible? Then one Mr. Govinda from Nepal, Buddha Koti from Nepal, said, want clarity on one more time regarding the four Gospels. So the question is, why not one instead of four pastors? Yeah, I think there are a lot of questions in this, uh, in this uh, set of questions. Uh, let's begin by uh, making something very clear. The Gospels that we have in our New Testament, we have four Gospels, right? They were all written in Greek. Keep in mind, Jesus did not speak Greek. Jesus spoke in Aramaic, just to remind us ourselves that the Hebrew Old Testament, I mean, the Old Testament is written in Hebrew and the New Testament, all the writings are in Greek, which was the lingua franca of the time, like kind of English has become in our time. So each of the four Gospels that the later on in the tradition of the church, the early church decided to have these four, they had some reasons for that canonicity, the apostolicity, they had certain criteria that they followed. But each of them was written to a different audience. And, um, but the purpose was always the same, to help the readers who were followers of Jesus, to follow him passionately, not to give up, and also maybe share uh, their faith with others. So when we read the Gospels, there is both this diversity that for us can be something like, why do we have this diversity? And there is also unity. Uh, there is no uniformity. So if we were looking for uniformity, we may be dismayed and we see some different parts of the story. But that is the beauty of God. I believe one of the reasons is God, God loves diversity. And so each gospel writer, by the way, none of them knew that their writings will land up in something called the New Testament. Okay, nobody in the first century knew a New Testament is coming. So they wrote to their communities, their version of the gospel. And later on the church said, we need all these four. And the question is, why only four? I'm glad there are only four. There could be 40. I, <laughs> it would be difficult to study them. The early church made this decision, as I said, based on certain criteria or uh, it had to be written by an apostle or under the supervision or authority of an apostle. But you know, it's very interesting, the question somebody asked, why not one, why four? In the second century, people thought about it and one wonderful man of God, Tatian, decided to, first of all, translate the Gospels from Greek to Syriac. Hmm. And then put all the four together into one writing which he called the dia tesseron dia through tessa four through the four. through the four and so can you imagine that work i don't know if it's easy to do putting all first of all translating into syriac and then putting it together but guess what the early church looked at it and said thank you tation this is fantastic but no thank you we still want to have our four gospels. gospels so we have these four beautifully diverse gospels instead of the one gospel but the important thing to that i would like to say here is and this is one of the differences with the the so-called uh, gospels of the second century we, we may talk about that later that every gospel has its own way of connecting the story of Jesus with what had happened earlier, the previous story of God's people, Israel. They all do it so interestingly differently. Let, just to give you one example, John 15 and verse 1, Jesus says, I am the true vine. Mm. The 
the branch the and you are the branches you know that and we hear that and we sometimes don't get what Jesus is saying there Jesus is connecting the story of Israel here you see Israel has been called a vine if you look at Psalm 80 verse 8 to 15 you look at Isaiah 5 Israel is called a vine and from there the story of Israel continues and Jesus now comes and says now it's time to show you where Israel is I am the true Israel so every gospel connects it beautifully the story with the story of Israel and it goes on and so we have these four beautiful perspectives on the gospel and each gospel writer is the gospel presents to us as disciples a unique shape of discipleship we need all these four gospels because they teach us from different perspectives what it means to be a follower of Jesus thank you pastor when we have this four gospels then we also have similarity and differences in this four, four gospels so we have several questions in that direction uh, Anita from Nagapatnam uh, she asks why some incidents get differ from gospel to gospel and we have Ruth Ankita from Bangalore her question is why does each gospel writer have different patterns in the writing pastor will you throw some light into that okay let me start with maybe an analogy uh, from food okay um, in India and around the world we consume rice in many forms we can just boil the rice we can have biryani which is popular in India or we can have some rice payasam which is sweet we can make idli or dosa with rice we can have rice noodles all this is made of rice but they look different by the time the, we have gone through a certain process they look so different now what would uh, that mean when you are reading the Gospels the Gospels think of that gospel as rice it is it is something that is common to all the Gospels but the shape and the texture the taste of each gospel becomes different by the time we have the uh, by the time we have uh, the writing of each of these gospels now many of us we tend to mix them up together a classic example uh, during Christmas our Christmas drama most often is we will see on the stage the shepherds are there and the wise men are there both are there at the same time now that's interesting because we know the shepherds are mentioned only in Luke's gospel and the wise men are mentioned only in Matthew's gospel but in our Christmas drama they have come together on the stage uh, they probably did not come together on the stage so here we are friends um, we tend to mix them up and uh, the variety God loves this diversity that is found in the gospel it's like a many faceted diamond thankfully there are four uh, you know sides to the gospel so uh, now talking about similarities not just in in the way the stories are put but also there are very strong verbal similarities example if you look at Matthew chapter 3 7 to 10 and Luke chapter 3 7 to 10 these are the words of John the baptizer and remember John did not speak in Greek but these words are written in Greek and we find that the Greek words are almost the same words that means there is something going on here so gospel scholars have been studying the similarities especially the words used here and they generally have a certain view about the, the gospel especially the first three they are called the synoptic gospels and the view is that Mark was most probably written first around AD 70 or so and then Matthew and Luke use this gospel of Mark to write their gospels along with other sources and then 
the understanding is, the major consensus is that there is another set of uh, writings or source called Q, is German word Quelle, which just means source, that was used by both Matthew and Luke. So you'll find a lot of similarities in Matthew and Luke that has probably come from another source. But then Matthew and Luke also have their own sources. So that's how they put together. Now, this should not surprise us. I think sometimes we may have a kind of a magical view of how the Gospels got written, a, a magical view of inspiration. So because of that, we find similarities, we wonder what has happened. The Luke has actually told us, right? I just read from Luke, that there are sources. He is also using sources. And so they put together in this, this beautiful way, God has allowed the writing of the four Gospels. God's word has come that way to us. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor. Now we want to look at the questions of authority in the Gospels, reliability and accuracy. And uh, we have some questions in that regard. Uh, Daisy Christina from Bangalore. Uh, the question is, how do you think that these Gospels evolved around the early Christians? And how will it evolve around the present days? It's an interesting question. One Mr. Gideon Carvalho from Margo, uh, Goa. His question is, how reliable are the Gospels? What do we do with seemingly minor contradictions between the Gospels? Does imperfect transmission mean that the Word of God is not 100% perfect? Mm -hmm. And we have one more question. Uh, Jebby T. John from Delhi. His question is, how do we deal with the apparent contradictions and then the historical reliability of the four Gospels? How do we trust the sermons and conversations that got recorded decades later? Well, this is, this is a good question and uh, Pastor Jebby is a dear friend who's also asked one of those questions. I think part of uh, our challenge we may have when we deal with the Gospels and the differences uh, uh, between different accounts may be due to our understanding of Scripture. Uh, as almost, you know, some kind of uh, mathematical certainty or as somebody uh, put the word 100% perfect. Uh, God's word is dependable, reliable, uh, accurate, uh, trustworthy. But using words like percentages and things like that may not be the right uh, modern way when we look at writing that God's people felt it was dependable. So, uh, one of the things to remember is that each of these writers are writing, we have said that already, from a different perspective. Okay? They are using different sources. They are going to arrange the story differently. That's how the differences come. They're going to adapt the stories, uh, select stories. They will leave out certain stories. You know, in the last chapter of uh, Gospel of John, the last verse says, Jesus did many things, but I cannot tell you all the in using hyperbole, he says, you know, even the world cannot hold all the books that Jesus has. So, uh, are they reliable, dependable? And the early church, which put these gospels together, they were closest to the events. They said, this is reliable. They said, this is dependable. We can stake our lives on it. Uh, maybe one of the scholars uh, who can be very helpful for you if you can just go on the net listen to him and maybe download uh, and uh, his one of his articles uh, let me just mention his name Richard Bockham B-A-U-C-K-H-A-M Richard Bockham uh, and uh, the article he has written is the canonicity of the four gospels the canonicity of the four gospel just go online our readers can do that and uh, and you can download this 10 page article one of the things he has shown in also his book jesus and the eyewitnesses the gospels as eyewitness testimony he has proved i think beyond doubt that what we have in these four gospels is based on eyewitness accounts in fact one of the reasons it is uh, reliable is 
it sounds so unbelievable how is that true how can it be that women are the first to see jesus you know because women's testimony was not even uh, you know uh, accepted so this is the most beautiful thing that we have yes they are interpreted yes they are passed down we believe that what god has done is there is this whole complex process of remembrance because the gospels were not written down right away because the, the apostles were there to preach and many others who saw jesus we read in first corinthians 15 there were even 500 people so they were preaching the gospel and you did not need to write down when the the preachers were there the original eyewitnesses but later on there was a need to write down so the complex process of remembrance tradition which is passing down writing rewriting all this is going on and we believe god has orchestrated this beautiful process uh, and through that has given us these reliable gospels uh, let me just read a quote from richard bockham's words he says this inseparable combination of fact and meaning history and interpretation that we have in the four gospels qualifies them for the authority that these gospels came to have for the mainstream church of the second and later century so there is history and there is interpretation too appropriately they came to be regarded as both the best access we have to the history of jesus and the normative understanding of the significance of that history for christian faith so this is the best way we can know jesus that is no other way dependable way that we have before us so this work of god that we see god's word comes to us and that in goes for the rest of the bible also god's word comes to us through a document written by god's people god did not write any of this god used his people but that's the way god's word comes to us and it is dependable god's word in human words and through this human process god's word comes to us thank you for that explanation pastor maybe it's a good place to ask you to give us how you think about inspiration in the bible and can you give us a capsule version i know it's a quite a big subject uh, can you talk to us on inspiration i think it's appropriate to speak about that because when people look at the bible we say the bible is the word of god and that is a good answer but it is not a complete answer when we say the bible is the word of god let me bring your attention to um, second Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 just like we remember John 3:16 maybe we should remember 2 Timothy 3:16 and uh, the verses from 14 15 about the holy scriptures and then in that verse Paul will say 2 Timothy 3:16 all scripture is and then he uses a very interesting word theopneustos which is a combination of two words god and breath that's why some translations use the word god breathed uh, th that's what i have here other translations use the word inspiration inspiration is breath breath coming in so uh, it is god breathed and is useful for teaching rebuking correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of god may be thoroughly equipped for every good work so what we read here is God's breath is on by the way when Paul says scriptures he's not referring to the new testament he's referring to the hebrews writings which the old testament and the church has always thought of that the writings of the new testament kind of continue in that same tradition they believe is god breathed now when we think of god breathed or inspiration we realize god does not have lungs god is spirit so what does it mean so it is a metaphor and for understanding that metaphor we will have to go back to the first instance when we read about god's breath and that's in genesis genesis 2:7 where god breathes on the humans and what happens 
they have life. So learning from that, we realize that the main way to understand inspiration is the writings of scripture are life-giving. Therefore, they are useful for all the purposes mentioned here. Now, please note, this does not mean we believe scripture is by dictation. The problem for many of us, we may be thinking in the way that our brothers and sisters from another major faith, they believe that their writing was dictated by God. We do not believe in dictation. We believe that through a very human process, we have received the scripture. Now, this should not surprise us because we are also those who believe as very different from the other two major religions of the world that believe in one God, both Judaism and Islam. We believe that God became human. Now, for many people, monotheists, that is an impossibility. God cannot come into human. But our Christian faith is based on that reality. God finally becomes human and becomes king. He comes to uh, bring his kingdom. So this is important to understand that scripture is God's word, but that's not complete, given in human words, found in history, time, culture, space, all that. So God's word in human words. It's not magical. There was not a ma magical download. Right. God used humans, a human process, but it is a life-giving writing that we have in, 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 in the scriptures. Thank you, Pastor. Scripture is God's word in human words, yeah. in time and culture. Yeah, a couple of more questions before we transition into the second uh, part of this conversation, Pastor. On the internet, there are rounds of discussions about the gospel by Mary Magdalene and Judas Iscariot. So this question is from one Mr. Jaldi J Daljit Singh from Mumbai. What is your take on the gospel of Mary Magdalene and Judas Iscariot? Yeah, I think this is a very good question and I was hoping that this question will come. So that is one place where we need to distinguish between the first century gospels. What we have in the New Testament are the first century gospels. But all the other writings that are talked about, the Gospel of Judas, the, uh, the Gospel of Thomas, all of them were written in the second century. Very often they are called Gnostic Gospels. Now, there is a huge difference between these uh, Gospels. And by the way, once again, let me remind you about uh, Richard Bockham's article on the canonicity of the four Gospels. And you can read through that. It's only 10 pages. It's really, it will help us to understand. So the first thing is, these Gospels that are being talked about now are writings from the second century. And generally, they are very different from these four Gospels. Let's look at some of the dif difference. Number one, the four canonical Gospels are narrative Gospels. And when you look at the other Gospels, they are not about telling the story of Jesus from the birth onwards, the life and death. They are more about some kind of esoteric teaching about Jesus. Very often they are post-resurrection accounts of what happened or what Jesus said. So the narratives that we have, and these narratives are embedded in history, in the canonical gospels. The other gospels don't need a historical setting because they are more trying to teach a certain view about spirituality. Sometimes they don't even use the word God. So our understanding of the Gospels is, is completely rooted in the Jewish understanding of monotheism of God in the Bible. Jewish monotheism. Uh, another important thing. They don't have any need for the whole story of Israel. You see, the good news of Jesus it's not something that you can just tell the news as if it's a separate thing and you don't need the story of the Old Testament. It is the final chapter. It's the climax of God's story, the coming of Jesus. But these uh, Gospels don't need the story of Israel. So they don't bother about connecting with the story of Israel. That's another major difference that we have with these other Gospels. So they are later, 
they are gnostic gospels their view of god very often is different from the jewish monotheism no connection no narrative of continuity from israel you know we had this few years ago this best seller which took over you know uh, da vinci code dan brown uh, and people were caught up with that but dan brown uh, it was fiction and so in fiction he fictionized a lot of things i mean i think he had also an agenda to kind of uh, be anti christian in some way to show the faults of the you know the christendom and things like that so people who read that just as assumed what he is saying is truth just like there's a lot of fake news that goes around people believe it intelligent people believe it right so i would say search the scriptures i would tell people who have these questions good questions but first of all read the four gospels make sure you have read them well and then you can at once touch and feel uh, what is a real gospel i remember some years ago i received in my hand some 1000 rupee notes that's time when 1000 rupees was there i did not realize they were fake notes and i gave it to somebody to use in a hospital and the hospital they looked at this they said this is fake notes and i was shocked i decided i must learn how do i know what is a fake 1000 rupee note and what is not and i decided to and i did and once i began to touch and feel and look for certain identification markers i at once could tell you a fake 1000 rupee note from a real one so i would like to tell our uh, listeners today that take time and read the gospels don't be satisfied by what you have heard and many people in our churches think they know the gospels because they know a lot of disjointed stories but if you ask them tell us what is there in the gospel of mark uh mm, they will kind of stutter like that so please read the gospels that's what i would tell our uh, listeners to read the gospels and then they will know the other gospels are so different from the from these gospels thank you pastor this is much uh, discussed things in the churches of late about the other gospels one more set of uh, questions before we transition uh, for the next second part of this conversation these questions are mainly about the application of the gospels the first question is from sister violet miranda from mangalore her question is what why does the church not teach on the four gospels rather only on topics very interesting second question is from one mr navin alapati from gangavati his question is the gospel was born amidst the uncertain cruel oppressive and evil times of the hist- of history overthrowing the pharaonic fantasies of holding power forever how can this be a message encouragement criticism for the church in india today and the next question is from sister sumarchana from secunderabad her question is how do we draw lessons from then and there in gospels to here and now from then and there to here and now in our indian context especially in understanding some passages which are grounded in jewish culture and judaism wow those are very good questions uh, pastor um i think one of the questions was why does the church not preach from the gospels uh, i think there are preachers who do focus on uh preach through a gospel and try to bring out some of the special characteristics that are there in each gospel as i said earlier and we will be looking at that in the second part each gospel has its own you know texture shape and taste uh, but i think it is easier to preach from passages or themes or topics uh, suppose i want to talk about forgiveness so i'll find a passage here and there so i think it's easier to do that but i would like to challenge if any of my friends who are pastors who are listening to this i would like to challenge them take time to study the gospels as a gospel each gospel separately and maybe attempt to preach maybe five or 10 messages through each gospel that will really challenge them but it will also help people to get a good feel for each gospel and so i would like to challenge my pastor friends to do that um 
the other question about the gospel came in the context of oppressive regimes like pharaonic uh, words that that was a very well framed question yes the gospel we preach that jesus is lord challenges every oppressive kingdom mm. if you remember uh, you know in the book of acts chapter 17 for example when paul is at thessalonica what is his message paul's basic message is always jesus is kurios is lord and the only other person in the in, at that time was called lord in that way is the roman emperor caesar so are you saying somebody else is there and whenever they preach jesus is lord very easily you could turn it around and make the 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 gospel speakers as anti-national anti-empire and sure sure enough in Acts 17 we read the people said they are preaching that there is another caesar another lord hmm so the gospel always challenges all regimes and that is what jesus has said and jesus has begun the work of the kingdom every single oppressive regime i'm going to preach now is going to come down i know they are still there right now but a time will come when jesus comes and every regime will be flattened and so we will then see the kingdom of god in all its fullness let me say this therefore not only does the gospel that we preach that the kingdom has come and is coming challenge all oppressive regimes but a question questioner also asked about what about the church yes of course this message is a double-edged sword. It's going to challenge us and all our kingdoms, if we have, that is being built without Christ, without a foundation of Christ. So I would say, yes, we need to preach this gospel of God's kingdom has come. I think the other question was more about how do we apply something that was given in a very clearly Jewish context? We are not Jews. We are here in India. How does it apply to us? And, and that is where the, the challenge of interpretation or application comes. First of all, we must work hard to understand what is the message. Understand that. Uh, and then how does it apply? I, I believe that once we have grappled properly with the historical particularity of the Gospels, what is happening there, Jesus is with the Samaritan woman, for example, or Jesus touches the leper, the outcast, or Jesus is sitting and eating with those that religious people don't want to sit with. After we understand that, we then work at how does it have a contemporary relevance? And I believe the scriptures always have a contemporary relevance to every century and to our time our culture maybe just an example how jesus dealt with women he he pushed beyond the barriers that were there uh, how jesus talked about the samaritans for example he he made the samaritan the hero of a story in luke chapter 10 mm. and he told the story to the jews who hated samaritans so we realize that Jesus was pushing the boundaries because he believed that in the kingdom of God, we all are one. That's a challenge to our Indian culture and aspects of Indian culture where we think of some people as being superior to others. So there are plenty of places where I think uh, the gospel comes and cuts through uh, our culture and our our practices so showing us this is the kingdom life this is how we live in the kingdom thank you pastor for that wonderful explanation the gospel will challenge all kingdoms and yes. even it can challenge us as the bride of christ and the kingdom in the kingdom of god we are all one and the gospel will cut through every people and every culture thank you so much uh, for this time Dear friends, it's time for a small interval. Please don't go away. Uh, in this time, we are going to have a short video of Pastor Jacob Charian teaching about the kingdom of God. 
and after that brother ebenezer prem kumar and team are going to give us a wonderful song uh, on the kingdom so after this teaching and this song we will get back again to this discussion thank you god bless you let me draw this how to understand what has happened in christ these two vertical lines obviously represent what god has done and what god will do and you have this line that is broke this is the first coming of christ and this is the second coming of christ when this line represents let's say the world or the evil age that is going on but with the first coming of christ do you notice there is a dot 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 this has received a death blow but with the coming of christ what has begun is the new creation has already begun which will come into completion with the second coming of christ so here we are with the life the death the burial the resurrection of jesus the new kingdom of god has been inaugurated this is the inauguration of the kingdom of god but a day is coming when you will have the consummation of the kingdom of god so we are somewhere here maybe all right we are living between the times between the first and the second coming when the world is also there but it is passing away 1 Corinthians 7:31 the world in its present form is passing away but it's still there the devil is still going around and the kingdom of god remember mark 1:15 jesus said repent believe the good news but he said the time is fulfilled the kingdom of god has come and jesus by his acts of deliverance and healing and resurrections or raising people from the dead all that was showing the kingdom has already come it has not fully come it has been inaugurated this is sometimes used the word already this is already here of course not yet here not yet already not yet we are living in between the already and the not yet and so the new creation has already started in christ that's what paul is saying in second corinthians 5:17 therefore if anyone is in christ you have entered new creation so that's why james will say do not love the world because there is no future here the value systems that the world teaches us here has no future in this kingdom of god in all its fullness the new age that is coming in fullness there is no future for these values that the world holds dear but there will be a continuation of these values and that is what paul says these judaizers don't realize that we have entered a new and it has nothing to do with following circumcision which was previous to this the sign of the covenant the sign of the covenant now is the holy spirit who circumcises our hearts we're going to declare that the kingdom of god is here we have the inheritance of christ in us and we're going to sing this with rejoicing amen let's rejoice and sing this we declare the kingdom of god is here we declare that the kingdom of god is here the kingdom of god is here. we declare that the kingdom of god is here we declare the kingdom of god is here. among you
Cause we're gonna declare he's the ancient of days Friends, welcome back. Welcome to the part two of our conversation with Pastor Jacob Cherian. We are looking at the four Gospels, the good news in the four Gospels. And we have finished the introduction part of it. And now we are going to look specifically into each of the four Gospels. We have received a few questions specifically about the four Gospels. Uh, so let us follow the order of the New Testament and begin with the Gospel of Matthew. We also have an online viewer uh, who has quest have a question on the Gospel of Matthew uh, from Sister Carolyn Patanwala. Her question is, Pastor, who were the wise men who came to present the gifts and were their pagans? And as you answer her and also from the Gospel of Matthew, Pastor, would you begin with a brief overview of the Gospel of Matthew? And then we can ask a couple of specific questions on Matthew. Okay. Yes. The Gospel of Matthew, as we, in our Bibles, where we have both the Hebrew Scriptures and the New Testament put together, you turn from the last book in our Bibles, that is Malachi, and you turn to the first book, in the New Testament is the Gospel of Matthew. Now, the Gospel of Matthew was clearly the, at least in the beginning, many years, centuries, was the most popular, well-liked Gospel. And uh, probably one reason is it has got the teachings of Jesus all well summarized or 
put together in blocks of teaching. And that is one of the uh, specialities or unique features of uh, the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, the Gospel of Matthew, why not we turn there? Why not we look at the very first verse? And when you read that, uh, Matthew will say, this is the genealogy of Jesus, the son, the Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David and the son of Abraham. And when you read uh, in, in, in the Greek text, it says, Biblos Genesios, the genesis uh, of, of Jesus Christ, son of David, son of Abraham. At once, you are again reminded of Genesis. So it's, uh, and then to connect with the story, I mentioned that is one of the signs of the canonical gospels, always connecting with the previous story. The story of Jesus doesn't appear out of nowhere. That's, that's one of our limitations or weaknesses when we preach the gospel as if suddenly that's where it begins with Jesus. Mm. It begins with the story of God's redemption that began in Genesis 12 when God saw God's creation, good creation, humankind goes their own way, messes up things, violence, degradation goes on and finally they reach Babel or Babylon. And then God calls from Babylon, Abraham, to, to bring about a people who will bring redemption for the world. So Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they go into e Egypt. God brings through Moses a people waiting for Israel to be the light to the nations. That was the purpose of God. But then this son of David, this son of Abraham has now come. He is the Messiah. Mm -hmm. So the connection of the story we find here. In, uh, in Matthew chapter 1. And one of the things about Matthew is, as I mentioned, he likes to connect the story with the Old Testament passages. Many places he may say, this was to fulfill what happened in, let's say, in the birth of Jesus, chapter 2. Micah is quoted that he will be born in Bethlehem. But more often in Matthew and in other Gospels and even in the other writings of the New Testament, there are so many allusions to Scripture. And anyone who notes Scripture, when I'm using Scripture now here as the Old Testament, what we call Old Testament, when you think of that, they will realize that here is Scripture coming out without saying it is quoted or cited. Mm -hmm. Now for that you need to know Scripture. Uh, one of the best places to think of that is something in our time. Uh, 1963, the famous message of Martin Luther King Jr. I have a dream. One of my favorite time uh, thing to listen to. Now, but if you listen to that carefully, you realize, by the way, Martin Luther King Jr. was a Baptist pastor. So where do you expect his language to come from, his ideas to come from? Obviously, from scripture. So when he says something like, I have been on the mountain top. Now, somebody who does not know scripture doesn't realize that he's speaking of when Moses was there on the mountain top. He saw the people. In fact, uh, Martin Luther King, MLK says that, that I may not be there in the promised land. And sure enough, he was shot and killed soon after. So, he, there are a lot of resonances in that speech. He will say, every valley shall be lifted up and all the mountains and, and hills shall be brought low. This very, very, very bringing down injustice. You know, this kind of language that he uses without saying he's quoting scripture. Now, for that is why when we read the Gospels, we should be on the lookout and be thinking, how does this connect with the scripture in, in the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures? So... That is another beautiful thing about Matthew. The next thing to remember is Matthew has, like every other gospel writer, arranged the gospel in a certain way. Okay? This is his arrangement. He has received the material and the writer has put it together. There is a special connection to Matthew, I believe, is there behind this, whoever the author is writing in Greek here. And he has decided to put it as in a certain way and he puts it into five big teaching blocks so these are like the pillars of the teachings of jesus let me just show show us uh, how we can look at that quickly if um, uh, listeners also are opening their bibles i hope uh, 
Jesus uh, chapter 5 5 6 7 is considered the first block of teaching right and very often called the Sermon on the Mount but when you read this carefully you will realize by the way it cannot be one sermon <laughs> he's brought in a lot of material from different places and puts it together so when you and very interesting at the end of every block of teaching he will give you a clue there is a formulaic ending for example here 5 2 says and he began to teach them and then you have this whole uh, you know blocks of teaching going on and on and on till the end of chapter 7 and when you come to 728 it says when Jesus had finished saying these things you saw that so in other words that is the end he has shown you that's the end he has another block of teaching coming in chapter 10 chapter 10 he will say verse 5 these 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions and the end of that is visible only in our chapter division 11 1 where it says after Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples just to remind our uh, listeners that these chapter divisions came much later in the 13th century 1200s so that's the ending of this block of teaching the third block of teaching is in chapter 13 that's all the parables of Jesus verse 3 will say 13 3 then he told them many things in parables and what uh, Matthew does is he puts them all together in another block of teaching and at the end of that look at verse 53 when Jesus had finished these parables you see that so clear uh, you know uh, uh, he makes a clear point here that that's the end of those parables then he has another block the fourth block in chapter 18 and when he finishes that block again you will find the the formulaic ending but this time it's in 191 when Jesus had finished saying these things so that's another block is over and finally the last block begins in chapter 23 then Jesus said this to the crowds and to his disciples so this is these are all uh, you know collections of the sayings of Jesus by Matthew and when does it end it comes please turn in your Bibles to 26 verse 1 so 23 24 25 is a last block when Jesus had finished saying all these things now that is so beautiful Matthew puts it all together in these five blocks and that is one of his important emphases in this book Jesus is the new Moses the one greater than Moses see so at the end for example when we come to the end of the book Jesus is on a mountaintop and there he tells see look at uh, chapter 28 verse 16 when the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain see the imagery of Moses on the mountain giving the law and now he says all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me therefore go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them all uh, to obey everything I have commanded you somebody asks, what should I teach my people I tell them well Matthew has put it in blocks for you if you want to teach the teachings of Jesus okay. so the focus on teaching that pastoral care that you find Matthew is interested in so Matthew has a focus on teaching Jesus is the son of David he's a son of Abraham but he's also God with us that is also one thing we read in the birth story of Jesus remember the birth story God with us so Matthew has a very special ah, I must mention this we mentioned that the core message of Jesus the good news is the kingdom of God but Matthew prefers to use the word kingdom of heaven I think it's because of his context because of his way just like in our Indian culture not all wives call their husband by name they have a respectful way in a certain cultures we may call them uh, you know different way so in the same way Matthew generally prefers to use the word kingdom of heaven as a circumlocution for God instead of saying kingdom of God that doesn't mean kingdom of heaven is going away to some place called heaven no 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 the kingdom of God has come and our hope is that it will come in its fullness where 
on earth that's why jesus told his disciples pray let thy kingdom come on, on earth us. as it is in heaven so ultimately that's a goal uh, we'll talk about the goal later so jesus is shown as the one who's a new moses that's why in matthew 11 jesus will say come learn of me i will teach you take my yoke upon you you don't have to bear the burdens of other yokes my yoke is easy my burden is light learn of me i am meek and humble so jesus is the new moses we have to learn from and so matthew has its own you know his own style of teaching things his own way let me just show you one interesting thing may interest some people in the genealogy um when you come to uh, you know there are three parts of the genealogy uh, from abraham to david, david then david to exile then exile to jesus approximately 14 i mean though if you read carefully it may not be 14 but verse 17 will say thus there were 14 generations from abraham to david 14 from david to exile and 14 from exile to messiah and any clever keen reader will ask the question really are there 14 and if you look carefully one example of that in uh, 18 uh the third part says jehoram was the father of zaya but if you read there are at least two places in the old testament you can check this out from kings and chronicles and you find there were three other kings between them so 14 generations is not 14 generations then oh so the bible has some mistakes no we need to understand that language in scripture the writers just like we when we speak we mean what we mean we don't always mean what we say so when matthew's arranging this he arranges it in 14 and one of the most best ways i have found to understand this 14 then is remember what is the first word of this of this gospel genealogy of jesus the messiah son of david. david and david is 14 now you may ask how is that pastor well you know the jewish people love to play around with letters so when they look at the letters of the hebrew alphabet they give numbers to that by the way that's the only way to understand 666 later on coming in it is not about computers and anything else it is a number for well you can listen to my other things is is caesar right so here when you write david let's think of it in english d v d but in 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 the hebrew it is dalet is the fourth letter wow is the sixth letter and again another dalet four so 4 plus 6 plus 4 is 14, 14. so what matthew has done is he doesn't care whether is 14 or 16 or 18 generations between here but he arranges it in a davidic form mm. in a davidic form and that is the way this each of these gospels are literary masterpieces and that's why i get fascinated and i get excited about this i wish i had even more time to sit and become you know more uh, specialized in each of these gospels so matthew's gospel is beautiful is different from the other gospels i think i should stop there because we need time for the other gospels also thank you pastor each of these gospels are literary uh, amazing works that they have done and i think we should have a seminar later <laughs> individually on the gospels uh, so that our audience all of us can study yeah. yeah pastor one more question that regarding matthew about the wise men uh, okay. you missed out wise men yes let's look at that you know very interesting uh, in most of our christmas programs uh, we have how many wise men three, three wise. always why three uh, i jokingly say because it is very difficult to find more than three wise men in this world <laughs> <laughs> well uh, again it's tradition because three gifts are mentioned mm. and we have songs like we three kings of orient are and so and all images i looked on google for an image where i would find more than three wise men all the images have only three, three. wise men okay. so that's we are stuck with tradition 
just to let people know that when it says here, it only says Magi. That means translated as wise men. And we don't know the number. So probably more than three. Just because three gifts are mentioned, we should not assume there were three wise men with three separate gifts. Anyway, but the question is, who were they, right? Who were they? It's a good question. And I don't know the answer. <laughs> but since I don't know, I can guess. I may be right. And most people realize, and by the way, the text itself says they came from the east. Now, because we don't have a clear mention where they came from, you know, speculation, tradition, stories have filled up, and we have beautiful stories. There's a movie made, The Fourth Wise Man, and all that kind of thing. Now, uh, these wise men, what we have here, clearly are people who, who are in a, maybe some kind of astrologers, or they are, you know, 2,000 years ago in, in the eastern part, maybe from Persia or places like that, who are studying. They, they take time to think about the stars and the movements of the stars, and probably... They saw something in the heavens, in the stars, that was unusual. And they began to think in their own way, what is this? Now, in this story, we are told that they are warned in a dream, hmm. not to go back to Herod, as we read later. So possibly they even saw some dream earlier. And so these wise men, by the way, they don't come at the birth of Jesus. They, it clearly says after Jesus was born. So putting them on the same stage with the shepherds is okay. It did not happen, but it's all right. Okay. But they somehow were guided by God and they decided to come. Who were they? They were obviously non Jews. Mm. And one of the reasons I believe that uh, Matthew has put this right in the beginning of the story is to tell us. See, in Luke's account, we had shepherds who came, they were Jewish people, Jewish shepherds. Here we have non-Jewish people already coming to worship. The first ones to worship Jesus. Right? And maybe this is a pointer that non-Jewish people are going to come and worship Jesus. All of us, I think on this show, all of us sitting here in India, we are all non-Jews. But we have worshipped the king of the Jews. And did you notice the word king of the Jews? Right there in the beginning, king of the Jews. So Jesus came as king and right there and then Matthew says they came to worship him as king of the Jews. Thank you, Pastor, okay. for that clarity on the wise men and uh, talking about the five teaching blocks of Matthew and how Matthew presents Jesus as the new Moses. And that gives us new perspective to read the Gospel of Matthew. There's one more question from the Gospel of Matthew from Peter Hendricks from Bangalore. Uh, his question is, how do reconcile the more authoritative, assertive and outcome-oriented emphasis of the Great Commission with its strong and imposing injunctions, go, make disciples of all nations, baptize them, teach them to obey, with more peaceable, less goal-oriented impulse to simply share the good news? Yes, that's a good question. And Peter Hendricks is a good friend of mine. Yes, it, it appears that the ending of Matthew, as we read it, is commanding. It's almost that Moses form, you know, go and preach and make disciples and baptize them and teach them. Yes, it, it, it is one, one way the gospel ends and very often this is called the Great Commission, right? But the other four Gospels, that's why I think we need all the Gospels. Uh, the other Gospels end differently. Look at Mark's Gospel. What an amazing ending. I mean, you suddenly have the women who are scared. That's it. And you are left with, oh, is the story over? I mean, it was so abrupt that later on, some others took passages from the other Gospels and created another ending. That's why in many of your Bibles, there will be a, uh, in our Bibles, there will be a mention that this is from, it's not found in the earliest of manuscripts of Mark. So, uh, John, he ends very differently. So, I think 
all the gospels are showing us that Jesus is the king who has come and if we believe this good news we have to tell it somehow uh, the gospel of Luke when we come to that continues in the into the book of Acts right and there he says when you believe this good news the spirit of God comes into you empowering you and you will be my witnesses so somehow or the other we have to go and be witnesses of this good news mm. that God has done and as we go we learn and we teach Jesus said first of all learn from me mm. learn of me so I as a pastor first of all I have to learn from Jesus and then teach others so I think all of us have to live out our witnesses and uh, yes it, it seems majestic and, and powerful in the Gospel of Matthew. I think that's what we need to hear. Every Gospel has it, its own command for us mm -hmm. and impulse and motivation. Yes. Thank you, Pastor. Let us spend some time ahead with the Gospel of Mark. Okay. So let's have an overview of the Mark, Pastor, uh, the Gospel of the Mark. So we would like to have an overview of the Gospel of Mark. By the way, for those who want to hear more, uh, City Harvest has had a short seminar with Pastor Jacob on the Gospel according to Mark. You can find it on YouTube, uh, the sessions on the Gospel of Mark. So Pastor, we would like to have an overview on the Gospel of Mark for us. All right. Why not we begin with the beginning, which is Mark chapter 1, verse 1. The beginning of the good news. There you are. Mm. The good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah, the prophet. And then he quotes a beautiful quotation from Isaiah. But he weaves in a couple of other scriptural portions there. And he says... A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And who is that going to be? Obviously, John the baptizer. So, Mark 1 1 says, This is the beginning of the good news. And anybody whose ear is tuned to Isaiah 52, we said that earlier, is hearing what is the good news? That the God of Israel has finally come. And he is going to set up his kingdom. This is the beginning. Jesus the Messiah. He is a son of God. And to prepare his way. Just like any important person comes. There is a preparation. Somebody comes ahead. And the one to prepare the way is John the baptizer. And so in this gospel. Mark's gospel. Mark has a very special way of weaving. The God. This is the shortest gospel among the four. It is a shorter one. And when you read the Greek, it is even simpler Greek, let's say, compared to, say, Luke's gospel. Luke's Greek is little... I mean, you won't notice this when you're reading in a translation. But Mark is also very adept and very purposeful when he's putting the stories together. So his purpose is to lead us to understand a couple of important things. Who is this Messiah? You see, the Jewish people, disciples of Jesus included, expected a Messiah who will come and kick out these Romans. Right? And so, as they began to follow Jesus, first of all, Jesus was casting out evil, delivering people, bringing in, in a sense, the new creation. Wow! He is the Messiah. So now, all what they learned from their grandmother about the Messiah and from their rabbis when the Messiah comes these dash dash Romans will be kicked out mm. and they were waiting for that so they start following Jesus he does miracles feeding the you know miraculously feeding people wow he's the Messiah so we come to this beautiful passage in chapter 8 for example and we find Jesus says Chapter 8, he asked his disciples, Who do you say I am? Verse 29. Peter, the one who very often speaks up for the other disciples, says, You are the Messiah. Now, interestingly, that's the right answer, but 
like our school teacher would have said if we gave a right answer good well done jesus tells him to shut up in fact in many places in mark when we read the story he tells them don't tell anybody and you wonder why if it's good news we should tell people right but in gospel of mark he's specially wanting to tell them wait because the next thing jesus does is explain that the son of man verse 31 is going to suffer many things he'll be killed it's horrible so instead of kicking out the romans he's going to be kicked by the romans and they are going to put him on a roman cross now that doesn't suit what we have grown up with jesus is what peter says and so the next verse peter took him aside and rebukes the messiah and that's when Jesus looks at all his disciples because all of them are thinking the same way and he rebuked Peter with very strong words get behind me Satan because you do not have in mind the concerns of God but merely human concerns what is that what happened to Peter just now he was open at one time it seemed to revelation from God now he's is opening up to what is human or even demonic and what is that so in chapter 9 and then 10 again jesus will talk about this suffering his passion that he's going to suffer and die and every time the disciples you see what happens after that they don't get it it's not easy all your life you have heard of a messiah who is going to bring in the kingdom by destroying your enemies that's how great kings come right but this Messiah says, I am going to be king on the cross. I'm going to be enthroned on a cross. What kind of Messiah is that? So obviously Peter has to rebuke Jesus. And Jesus says, then soon after that, Jesus says in 9, 834, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. The reason Jesus does not allow his disciples to speak up yet is they don't understand the nature of discipleship. They know the Messiah. But what is the Messiah called to do? So in this central section where you have two uh, healings of two blind men. Very interesting. Uh, no, no time to explain everything here. Within that is this very important teaching on discipleship. So Mark then tells you how this Messiah is going to be king. And he leads you up to the cross and interestingly, in Mark chapter 15, when Jesus is on the cross, something happens. Verse 38. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. That is a sign that God's business in the temple is over. Because now we have a new temple. That's the body of Jesus to enter into the presence of God. And then one of the centurions, a Roman, the one who crucified him, he says, surely this man was a son of God. Now that is so unusual. A proclamation by a, not one of the disciples here, a person who receives this revelation, somehow he recognizes this man is a son of God. And so we have Mark shaping this gospel to encourage, probably Mark was writing to believers who were suffering in the Roman Empire maybe in and around Rome, and to encourage them that suffering, the cross-bearing life, is part of our discipleship. In fact, that is our calling. And it is in calling to be a servant, to serve others, that we are called to follow Jesus, the servant who died on the cross. So Mark is very, very beautiful, very unusual in many ways, uh, but again, unique in that form. Thank you, Pastor. The Gospels are so unique and so different, but it has such profound message. And thank you so much for explaining the Gospel of Mark. And from uh, what you spoke about the suffering servant, we have the next question from Dabashish Bihari from Koraput, Odisha. He is touching on Mark chapter 10 verse 45 and he wants an explanation. Mark chapter 10 verse 45 for the son for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Can you explain this, Pastor? Yeah. Chapter, as I mentioned, 
there are three passion predictions. Passion here meaning suffering of Jesus. Chapter 8, 9 and 10. And so this story comes right after Jesus has talked to them about his suffering and then he speaks to them about suffering and James and John want to have the right and the left. They don't understand about suffering. They want to have positions of authority and then Jesus tells them, you don't understand. In fact, he says, the rulers of the Gentiles, they think to be the king is to rule over people, boss over them. But I'm telling you, in my kingdom, and I as king am showing the way, in my kingdom, the servant is the king. And I, the son of man, by the way, the son of man is a title that goes back to the Old Testament. It is a messianic title from Daniel chapter 7. And so he says, the son of man, the divine son of man himself has come to serve. Not only to serve, but give his life a ransom for many. It is to show us that in the same way, we who follow this servant king, we too are called to serve and give our life if we are followers of this king. It's beautiful. Uh, very many people think of this as the key verse of the Gospel of Mark. It's, it is definitely a central passage. Thank you, Pastor. We too are called to serve and to give our life for the sake of the kingdom. Thank you so much for explaining that. Uh, Pastor, one question from Mark chapter 11 verse 13 from Tina Bangalore. Her question is uh, regarding the cursing of the fig tree in Mark chapter 11 verse 13. In the book of Mark, it's mentioned that it wasn't the season for figs. Yet Jesus cursed the tree as he couldn't find any fruit. Can you help me understand why Jesus cursed the fig tree? Yeah. Yeah. This... I mean, um, I love to teach from this passage because it reveals something very, very important about what Jesus is doing here. Many of us grew up with a, this, even in our Bibles, you know, the section where Jesus goes into the temple. Uh, the one I'm holding here, it says, Jesus clears the temple courts. Very many times we talk about cleansing of the temple. Now, if you read Mark carefully, there is something in Mark. He does this in many places in Mark, which is, scholars have used the word Mark and sandwich. What is a Mark and sandwich? He takes a story, like two, maybe, you know, slices of bread or two, two buns, and puts something in between. So if you have chicken inside, it becomes chicken sandwich. If you have cheese, it becomes cheese sandwich. But you have to eat it together. In the same way, what Mark very often does, and this is a beautiful, my favorite Mark and sandwich, is Jesus is talking about the cursing of the fig tree. And yes, very clearly he says it is not the season. And then what he does is, if you look carefully, he starts off talking about it in, in the first part of the story. And then in the second part of the story, in verse 20, he says, In the morning as they went out along, they saw the fig tree with dirt from the roots. So he has divided the story in two bits and in between put another story of Jesus' actions in the temple. Now I want to say that this is not the cleansing of the temple. Jesus did not clean anything. Probably the next day they were back. Okay? To understand this, we need to realize what he has done. Along with the cursing of the fig tree, he has put the story. So Jesus is not cleaning anything. If at all, he may be cursing something. So what does this fig tree represent? Well, again, look at the words that Jesus uses when he speaks in the temple. He says, my house is a house of prayer for all nations. Where is that coming from? Isaiah 56 verse 7. And then he says, but you have made it a den of robbers. Where is that coming from? Jeremiah 7.11 Anybody whose ears are tuned to scripture realizes he is speaking the language of Jeremiah. What did Jeremiah do? He came into the temple and told the people in the temple you have made this temple a den of robbers therefore this temple will be destroyed and the temple was destroyed by the Babylonians. Jesus is using the same words. 
And what Jesus is saying is, this temple business is finished. It's over with. That's why at the end of, we read the cross, God tears the curtain. And so this becomes not the cleansing of the temple, it is a prophetic pronouncement against the temple. So the cursing of the fig tree is only a symbol that, by the way, the fig tree in many passages in scripture, I can give you the many texts are there, that refer to Israel as fig tree. Israel's religious is a lot of leaves. He says it's full of leaves, but no fruit. So Israel has failed. See, God's purpose was not to save Israel. God's purpose was to save the world through Israel. And when God sees that Israel fails, God comes and becomes Israel. That's what Jesus became, Israel. That's the way to read the Gospels. Many places you can understand Jesus taking the role of Israel. And so here it is. Jesus is pronouncing judgment on the temple. And so the fig tree becomes a, a, another sign that Israel has failed. And so the temple will be destroyed. All this will happen because God now begins all over again in Jesus, the kingdom. So yes, this is not the cleansing of the temple. This is the cursing of the temple in a sense. It was symbolic. By the way, probably the next day those guys came back with their business. But we know this. Very soon after, less than 40 years later, AD 70, the temple is destroyed. That's what Jesus meant. We read that in Matthew 24. This generation will not pass away till this is finished. That was talking about that generation. Okay, so it happened. So this is a very significant story. And, and I like this question. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Pastor. Will you throw some light on uh, whether Jesus cleansed the temple twice or he did it <laughs> once? Because John mentions it in the early part of his gospel whereas here we have towards the end of the gospel yeah. good very good question uh, I, I would I would say that uh, there is a small simple uh, write-up uh, that I have done if you google my name and did Jesus cleanse the temple you will find that article but your question is good so sometimes because John mentions the, the action in the temple the prophetic action in chapter 2 all the other gospel writers mention it at the end of which kind of they understood it the religious leaders understood what he was saying that's why they said well we have to kill him now you see so but John doesn't have one at the end so John has one in the beginning the other three gospels have at the end so some people thought maybe there was one in the beginning and one at the end and that is because we made an assumption that John is in chronological order and when we come to John, we will realize, no, John is not. And so, I don't believe there were two so-called cleansings, prophetic actions. There was only one. John chooses to bring that right in the beginning. And that's the way John works, which is different. And when we come to John, we'll talk about it. So, there was only one cleansing, and each gospel mentions one. John puts it in the beginning of the story. Thank you, Pastor. Let's move on to the Gospel of Luke. Uh, how do you give us an outline of Luke, Pastor? Matthew, you spoke about the teaching blocks and Jesus uh, is presented as the new Moses and, and uh, Mark and Sandwich. And how do you uh, like to give us an outline of the Gospel of Luke? Again, for those who want to, we have a seminar on Luke, uh, the Kingdom Agenda. And it's again on the YouTube channel of City Harvest. And if you want to study the Gospel of Luke, you have the seminar uh, that is there. You can just Google this in City Harvest and you will find it. So, Pastor, how do you give us an outline of the Gospel of Luke? Yeah. By the way, just to remind people that among the four Gospels, the longest Gospel is the Gospel of Luke. Now, some of us may think Luke has 24 chapters, Mark, uh, Matthew has 28. But remember, these chapters are not equal. So... Actually, Luke is longer than Matthew. Also, 
Luke is different from the other four Gospels because Luke is only part one. Part two is the book of Acts. And so when the New Testament was put together, the four Gospels were put together, but Acts had to come after John because John is one of the Gospels. And so Luke and Acts together have to be studied together, always. Uh, part one, part two. So the story that begins in Luke continues into the book of Acts. When I used to study the Gospel of Luke and teach it, I used to say this is my favorite Gospel. And that's when I realized. But when I studied Mark, I loved it so much. And when I studied John, I said, wow, I love John. So it's like if somebody has, you know, four sons, it, maybe it's not fair uh, to just like one. And uh, so I have two children. I love both of my children. But they're so different, right? So Luke is fascinating. Again, uh, it has a unique way of presenting the gospel, the good news. And it specializes in certain things. It wants to show that this is for all people. So even the way he quotes from scripture uh, will be slightly different. When he, uh, and uh, uh, for example, when he quotes in chapter 4, the, uh, the spirit of the Lord uh, is there. One minute. Um, here when he quotes uh, 418 yeah from uh, no it's from chapter 3 uh, when uh, he quotes from Isaiah the prophet and uh, you remember when we read Mark's gospel that is the verse that was beginning Isaiah 40 verse 3 to 5 but here he goes on and he brings you to verse 6 all people will see God's salvation so even that text in Mark 1 he doesn't come so far so Luke has a special purpose uh, when the baby Jesus is picked up by uh, the old man Simeon and in his song he says uh, uh, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel but so Jesus is for all people and there's a good possibility that Luke himself was a Gentile uh, that's a good possibility or maybe he was a Gentile who became a Jew and then became a follower of Jesus. We are not 100% sure. But there's a good chance that he himself was a Gentile. So there is this focus on all people that you see in Luke. All kinds of people. Even the ones we don't like. The religious people don't like. So you have those, uh, you know, many places where Jesus is eating with those bad people as you would call them. Uh, you have uh, special stories like he goes into the house of Zacchaeus as only in Luke uh, when Jesus in chapter 4 goes to the synagogue in uh, Nazareth he, he first when he tells his story the spirit of the Lord is upon me they are all very happy with oh he's from our place and then they began to ask him certain questions show us uh, you know uh, what you did in other places we have heard you did some miracles in Capernaum show us and that's when Jesus told them two stories two stories of God's care for non-Israelites and the result was what happened verse 28 they became so angry they took him by force to kill him very interesting they could not handle the fact that God cares equally for people who are not Israelites. So Luke tells you the story. It's amazing that this feature of uh, God's concern for all. At all levels, Samaritans. There are four unique Samaritan stories in Luke's gospel. You know the hero in Luke uh, 17 is it? Where... Ten lepers, we learned that in Sunday school, ten lepers came back and one, only one person. And I always thought, oh, only one gave thanks. We should not be like the others. We should be like that one. But the point I never got was, the one who came back was a Samaritan. And so Jesus makes the Samaritans the focus of his uh, stories, parables in the Gospel of Luke. That is so counter-Jewish culture. Challenging their cultures so God's kingdom is an upside down kingdom let me quickly say so what is Luke how does he arrange his gospel he arranges Jesus on a journey so for example he will begin in chapter 9 verse 51 
that is where jesus begins a journey towards jerusalem and he does not reach jerusalem for a long time he's still going on and on and on and on and on that's his way of style okay of showing jesus on a journey because god's people are always on a journey right so he's on a journey to jerusalem finally in 19th chapter 28 verse he reaches jerusalem in between he tells a lot of things he puts the stories together why does he want to show jesus on a journey jesus full of the holy spirit is on a journey to jerusalem to do god's work there which is to die and to rise again then in the volume 2 he will show what jesus he will say what jesus began to do was in in luke's gospel now what jesus continues to do through the church from jerusalem going into judea going into samaria going into the whole world so you have church full of the holy spirit now going into the world no more from jerusalem now to the world now where is the church from where to where from bangalore to bangkok or to buenos aires wherever god takes us from every place in the world where god's people are we have to go wherever god takes us so that is the wonderful message of luke's gospel continuing into volume 2 so luke emphasizes that god's kingdom in the worldly eyes is an upside down kingdom and god's value system is different from the value system of this world so that's why he challenges us you know the john the baptizer in this gospel says something that you will not find in the other gospels about john the baptizer luke chapter 3 verses 10 to 11 when people come there are three questions three groups of questioners who ask so what should we do you are saying we should repent what should we do <laughs> like a true prophet of old testament that's why he's there resonances of isaiah 58 that chapter on fasting we talk about he says those who have food share with the hungry those who have two clothing set of clothing give away one this is not about giving 10% or anything it's like giving half and learn to be content with your pay don't exploit people wow this is the way of the kingdom prepare for that kingdom that is to come by living this way now so luke introduces this upside we you know when zacchaeus jesus comes into his house what is his response i'm going to give or i give there's one two ways of interpreting that that he is already doing that or he will give the greek allows for both i will give half to the poor he says jesus doesn't say hold on one minute you need to give tithes first some may say oh he got all the money Uh, from in illegal means no mention that he was doing something illegal he was just part of a corrupt system this world is set up on values that are not kingdom of god values that is why one person sitting on the computer and just moving some this thing and that thing on his computer can make a million dollars sitting in the morning while he's having his morning coffee and somebody else who works the whole year or whole lifetime will not make that this is the way this world is set up it's not an equal world there is no justice or righteousness inbuilt in the system so when god's kingdom comes there will be justice the poor blessed are the poor and that's something very special in uh, the gospel of luke uh, i must say this gospel of luke 624 will say blessed are the poor Many of us remember Matthew 5:3 Blessed are the poor in spirit. We need both. And in Luke 6:24, 6:20 and 24, then 24 it will say bless uh, woe unto you who are rich. Probably you will not hear many preachers who like to say that you know God wants you to be just keep on growing in prosperity. Uh they may not mention or know this passage. Because in this upside down kingdom even the poor are blessed and those who share with the poor are blessed that's why you have a story of a man who lands up in hades in a bad place in hades because he did not care for the poor right the rich man and lazarus story so luke i i get excited when i talk about luke's gospel 
Thank you, Pastor. Can you also speak about the emphasis of women in Luke and and how do you, uh, what do you want to talk to us about the emphasis of yes, women? Yes, yes, and yes. And also one more online question on Luke from Brother Gonapale. He is asking the question: Did Apostle Paul continue? Uh, con did Apostle Paul contribute to Mark and Luke writings? Wow, that's that's a good question. Did Apostle Paul have a part to play in Luke's writing and John Mark's writing? Because both of them were uh, were with Paul at certain times, and that's a great question. Um, I would say maybe in the ethos of it, but remember the Gospels, especially the synop these two Gospels we mentioned, Mark and Luke, talk about the life of Jesus till the resurrection and Paul would not know much about that right so Paul himself has to hear these stories from the apostles who were with Jesus most probably Paul never saw the earthly Jesus before the resurrection he saw the risen Jesus so I think in some ways maybe the ethos of the gospels could be in, uh, influenced by Paul's understanding that the gospel is for all especially the Gentiles yes but in terms of the, the nitty-gritty of the Gospels, I don't know uh, whether Paul has a, has a special view about Jesus to put in there. Yeah. And you asked about the, Paul and, uh, sorry, the Gospel and women. Yes. Yeah. Women have a very special place in the Gospel of Luke. For example, we begin with uh, the first person to hear the Gospel actually is Mary. And we have... Uh, Another woman full of the Holy Spirit in this gospel uh, is uh, uh, Elizabeth, right? So right in the beginning, we have two women, one younger, much younger, and one older, both full of the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and by the way, this is found only, these stories are found in, and Mary's song is one of the most beautiful, theologically rich, uh, you know, writings that, shows us what God is like. He's the God who fills the hungry with good things and he brings down the proud and the rich, it says. Wow. So Mary's idea, by the way, that song of Mary is very often uh, understood as being influenced by the song of Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 2. So you see the women there. We see women following Jesus. Look at chapter, <coughs> chapter 8, for example, verses 1 to 3. Jesus had women disciples. Many. Jesus, how many disciples did he have? Many, many times we'll say 12. No, Jesus had many disciples. In one place we see that he sent out 70 or 72, right? So among them he chose 12 men to represent Israel. And sure enough, there were some people may ask, why not a woman? Yes, it was not easy to have in 2000 years ago a woman representing the part of Jesus but look at this chapter 8 there are many women who are traveling with Jesus and it says in verse 3 these women were helping to support them out of their own means some of them are women of means look at Joanna the wife of Cusa the manager of Herod's household so a number of women were also present in the entourage of Jesus so there is this focus on women ah chapter 7 we have the story of a sinful woman who anoints Jesus. And Jesus says she has done something beautiful for me. Uh, so in the, uh, let me see if there, yes, another one in chapter 10. You have the story found only here. Jesus allows Mary to sit at his feet. That is the posture of learning from a rabbi. And he allows her Martha, don't worry, we can wait. The dinner can be a little later. But Mary has chosen the path of being a disciple and that is the best place to be in. And I think that's where I would like to be, at the feet of Jesus first, to be disciples. And uh, I want to be known as a good disciple rather than just a good preacher. And uh, so we have these stories which are, by the way, all are unique to the story of Jesus. Um, uh, or the, the stories in this gospel. So, yes, women have a very special place 
in the Gospel of Luke. And when we come to the book of Acts, again there are some women who are highlighted in the story in the book of Acts. Acts 1.14, we think of the 120 on the day of Pentecost, very clearly says, and with the women, we don't know how many, but Mary the mother of Jesus is mentioned. So women have always been part of the story. And in many of our churches, they are the majority. And so I believe God wants to use every believer, male or female, men or women, boys and girls, because we are all been gifted by the Spirit to function in the different gifts. Uh, finally, let us focus on the Gospel of John. Quite a few questions from our audience. Uh, Brother Rajkumar Ray from Odisha, he has a question. Why is the Gospel according to John different from the other three Gospels? Uh, Brother Samuel from Chennai, uh, his question is, tell us about different themes of the Gospel of John. For example, light and darkness. Okay. Well, Gospel of John, another rich, rich Gospel. Uh, one of the uh, writers on the Gospel of John said something like this, that the Gospel of John is such that a small baby can safely wade in, but an elephant can drown. Hmm. It is... It is accessible to everybody and yet it is very, very deep. Now the moment we open this gospel, we realize, yes, it is different. It is connecting to the story of the Old Testament very differently from the other three gospels. That's why we use the language of, we have a technical word for the first three gospels. We call it the synoptic. Sun together, optic to see. We can see those three gospels separately. This gospel is the autoptic gospel, you have to look at it by itself. It is different because God likes difference. That's why I'm so different from you. You are so, you are, I'm glad you are not like me. We are so different. All of us are different. So this gospel is beautifully different, unique. See the beginning. In the beginning was the word. The moment you read that in the beginning was the word, you are thinking of the first line of scripture that is in the beginning. God created and we are reminded of that creation of God so using that language in the beginning was the word the word was with God and then he says something amazing and the word was God now a good reading that I wish we had time to study this in a Greek class but there are some people who mistranslate this and say the, in the, and the word was a God Friends, what John in the very beginning is saying, this word I'm going to talk about, he is God. Not only that, in verse 18 he will say he has revealed, the only one who has revealed the Father to us is this God who has become flesh, verse 14. So he starts with this high sounding, everybody's ears are tuned to the book of Genesis. And then, very interesting, he has seven days of creation also, that's how it appears here. For example, from verse 19, after the prologue, he starts off and says, this is what happened with John. So the first day is there. Do you notice in verse 29, it says the next day. Okay, that's like the second day. I mean, by now we know John is not talking chronology. Because we already said in chapter 2, the, the action in the temple is not in the beginning, it is afterwards. So this is carefully crafted the next day you see that verse 29 and then verse 35 day 3 the next day then uh, 43 the next day that is day 4 and look at 2 1 on the third day seventh day and Jesus does his first sign or miracle on the seventh day wow so basically John is also saying this is the new creation that Jesus is bringing in. So, but he does it very differently. In a different style, in a different way. And therefore, his perspective is different from the other writers. It's a, it's a post-resurrection perspective. Already, right in the beginning he has told you, Jesus, this one, is God. 
he was god first verse so he doesn't wait to tell you later on yes it is revealed later on you know uh, thomas will say my lord and my god all that is there but from the right in the beginning so perspective wise john is different so john as it has been traditionally called is based this gospel is based on the eyewitness account of somebody who is very enigmatically called the beloved disciple now who is this beloved disciple my goodness scholars have written so much about it of course a traditional view i still want to hold on to that maybe right is that it is john son of zebedee but there are others who think it could be john another john john the elder is such a common name or there are other arguments for maybe it's james the brother of jesus or there is a very good argument saying it is lazarus very interesting so many things in the bible we don't always know the uh, what do you call it authorship of we go with the authority right so many books in the bible judges first kings second chronicles all those are written by god's people we don't know exactly who wrote it uh, even the book of job is not written by job right so we realize that this beloved disciple his witness is uh, this whole gospel is based on his witness but looks like when you come to the end the author's hand comes up and he said verse 24 the last chapter this is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down we know that his testimony is true that means now the writer who is putting this together is maybe a follower of this beloved disciple or a friend or a community whatever and you know in scholarship we may debate about this but all this is put together and traditionally it is supposed to come from john's uh, the disciple and what is his purpose he makes his purpose very clear at the end of chapter 20 um, chapter 20 verse 31 he will say many things jesus did but this i am writing these are written that you may have that you may believe that jesus is the messiah the son of god and that by believing you may have life in his name one of the things about john is he does not use the kingdom language so much there is a kingdom coming nicodemus he says he cannot enter the kingdom right but generally he prefers to use the eternal life the messiah is bringing eternal life to people so that's how he looks at it he arranges it differently there are miracles he calls them signs so there are seven signs then he has statements of jesus like the i am sayings i am the good shepherd i am the gate of the sheepfold i am the resurrection and the life and so he arranges the gospel slightly different chapters 1 to 12 they're very often called the book of signs then chapters 13 to 21 very often called the book of glory where jesus goes to his glory mm. on the cross so again a beautiful gospel let me just say this before i forget for those of our listeners who would like to learn some of these things how these gospels are crafted and arranged it's really beautiful and one of the best places to learn that are the simple short very beautifully done videos of bible project so if you don't know to the friends who are listening if you don't know bible project just type on youtube bible project matthew bible project mark luke john and other books of the bible there are hundreds of videos and by the way they have some of those are now translated into some of our languages so if you type hindi you may find some hindi uh, uh, videos so each gospel is unique and beautiful thank you pastor pastor we have a couple more questions and some interesting questions about the second coming of christ would you have time to we have our online viewers they are watching us <laughs> would you have time or? yes we, yes we, we can, can go we, ahead you could go yeah. ahead for some more time yeah. so dear friends if you spare some time with us we have some questions interesting questions on the second coming of christ and we would like to hear from dr jacob charian his take on the second coming of the lord jesus christ so hold on the next question is from nirmala sister nirmala from bangalore at the wedding at cana why does jesus tell mary 
woman, my time hasn't yet come. And then he goes on to perform the miracle. Oh, I love, I love to talk about this. This is one of those places where we recognize that Jesus did not speak in English. <laughs> Neither did he speak, you know, Tamil or Malayalam, 3A, or Mahila or Nari in, uh, you know, uh, in Hindi. Jesus spoke in Aramaic. But we are reading the gospel written in Greek. So the words in Greek and the word used here is a simple Greek word, gunai. Gunai is the vocative case or when you address somebody, a, the woman is the word gune, like you have gynecology. Okay? So when you address the person, you say gunai. But in the Greek culture, now this is where we had to remember, this is in Greek. In the Greek culture, gunai has a respectful uh, tone. So you, it's something like madam. So I could call my mother madam, dear lady, right? But the problem comes of translation. So this is the challenge, friends, we have of uh, translating from one language to the other. So when it, you translate that, typically it is woman. Very interestingly, I have noticed that in, um, in um, Telugu and in Kannada, the translators have decided to keep it amma. Mother. I think one English translation I noticed also has made it mother. Because otherwise we misunderstand this. But this is the reality of working from one language to the other. Jesus did not speak any of our languages. He spoke something in Aramaic which we don't have. So Jesus was not putting down his mother. Why would he? If you, you and I won't do that, right? I won't call my mother, you know, woman. Uh, Unless I'm speaking in Greek to my mother and we are living in a Greek culture. Mm. Now, what did Jesus say? What did he mean by that? He was, first of all, respectful in the Greek. And, by the way, the same words are used at the cross. Woman, behold your son. That's a respectful way there. He's not trying to put her in a place or anything. And uh, let's not use this passage to, to speak out at other, our fellow believers who may be in another you know, church tradition. Now, then he says, my hour has not yet come. That is the thing we must keep in mind. Jesus is a, going to do his first miracle as John portrays it. What is going to happen is, the moment he does this miracle, people will start saying, oh, he's the Messiah. And crowds will come and opposition will come and Jesus will be hurtling forward towards the hour and in the gospel of John the hour is my hour has come Jesus will say what is that time of being glorified the son of man will be lifted up what is being lifted up you know many years ago we used to sing a song lift Jesus higher lift Jesus higher but actually in gospel of John Jesus lifting up was on the cross that is the hour when Jesus will be crowned as king. His enthronement on the cross. Now that goes counter every Jewish fiber of their understanding of their Messiah. So Jesus was very respectful to his mother always. And here he is not putting her down uh, by saying gunai. By the way, Jesus did not use gunai. He would have used the Aramaic for mother. But that's all we have. So we have misunderstood it and misused this passage sometimes. And uh, we need to realize that Jesus' mother had a very special place in the salvation program. And she is in a sense portrayed as the first disciple. And we follow in her path. She brought Jesus into the world. And you and I have the privilege also of bringing Jesus into our world through our witness and life. So, some have brought questions on the Gospel of John. Uh, Brother Prayson from Timothy from Satur, his question is how to interpret parables. And uh, Mr. Vergis Parail from Dubai, his question is more understanding 
on the parables. Okay. Uh, interestingly, I think this is a general question we, we, we are looking at. There are no parables in that sense in the Gospel of John, interestingly. And that's one of the unique features of John. But if you understand the word parable as a far more um, richer understanding, like the Hebrew mashal, you know, it has a broader understanding, not just about the way we think of parable stories, but something that illustrates uh, a truth. So in John's gospel, we have a lot of allegories, right? We have a lot of metaphors and allegories. They are rich in their own way. But we find what we generally call parables in the other three Gospels. Uh, one of those places where we have so many parables is the majority, the largest number is the Gospel of Luke. Maybe we need to have a session on parables. Uh, so parables are Jesus' way of bringing people into the reality of the kingdom. They are generally parables of the kingdom. What is the kingdom like? The kingdom is like a rich man who threw a party to pe invite people they didn't want to come he told his servants I will not waste this food go into the highways byways bring everybody in people you don't expect have a chance they get a chance parables will shock people for example in Matthew 20 you have a parable where Jesus tells a story about a man who gets people to work from morning 6 to night 6 evening 6 and he starts paying the person who worked only one hour, this full wage. <gasps> and the others also get the same wage. They are shocked by God's generosity. Parables are a way to show God's love, God's generosity, God's kingdom, what God expects in the kingdom. Maybe the story that we call the parable of the good Samaritan, that's a, I don't want to say bad title, but it is not the best way to understand that story. It is a story of the good enemy. Actually, Luke chapter 9, you have a story where the disciples want to burn down a Samaritan village because they did not welcome them with garlands. Right? And right after that, you hear this story about Jesus trying to answer a man, very smart guy. Smarty Pants wants to ask Jesus. He wants to justify himself. He wanted to put Jesus down publicly. Who is my neighbor? And Jesus' answer is this. He looks at him and says, My friend, if you only understood the kingdom that I have ushered in. Because in this kingdom, let me tell you a story. The one who is lying on the road is obviously a Jewish man. Jesus is speaking to Jewish people. The one who finally picks him up and saves his life is the enemy of the Jew, a Samaritan. So he said, now tell me, if you are on the road and your enemy picks you up, whom you would not have picked up, tell me what kind of kingdom am I calling you into? A kingdom where you love your enemies. Kingdom where you forgive your enemies. That's why a few years ago, we all know the story of Graham Staines and his two sons. The day after his wife, what did she say? Gladys Staines told the whole world, I forgive them. That is the kingdom that has been ushered in. And that is the power of these parables. But these parables also have another function. They have the function of hiding the truth from those who don't want the truth. So if you don't want the truth, you will not get anything from this. But those who want to get the truth, those who are eager, want to follow Jesus, this in simple ways provides them with the truth. So these parables are beautiful and uh, ways to understand this kingdom, the good news of the kingdom. This is the type of kingdom that Jesus has brought. Thank you, Pastor. I okay. think we should discuss on parables <laughs> and uh, have a session on the parables. Uh, does the gospel of, uh, gosp do the gospels record Jesus' disciples Offering, offering him worship as God? That's a good question. Very good question. It's not in, um, you know, easy to give a short answer, but I'll try. In the Gospels, we especially let's talk about the first three. Definitely the disciples 
recognize him as a divine figure more than a prophet the messiah but i don't think they understand him he is god not yet right so uh, they don't worship him as god but they are in a process that see even the jesus many use the word son of man the son of man figure is a divine figure it's a from daniel 7 but their understanding of who finally jesus is please understand i mean the disciples don't understand what we today talk about trinity father son holy spirit they don't understand all that that is going to come later after the coming of the holy spirit jesus said he will teach you you will begin to understand after that so here we are later on they understand that jesus is he was god in flesh now the gospel of john as i said already is written from a post resurrection perspective so right in the beginning in the first verse it says the word was god and so that perspective but the disciples i believe were on a journey of recognizing otherwise you know even after resurrection they still have questions they are hiding and then they wait for the coming and they are finally when the holy spirit comes they understand they are empowered now they are willing to risk their lives after they saw the risen jesus they are willing to risk their lives we have a question on hell oh my <laughs> what is the role of hell in the gospels especially in its significance the presentation of an urgency for the spread of the good news yeah i know this question is is very important it's a biblical question sometimes unfortunately this question can have can take on a role which i don't think the gospels give or the whole new testament gives so let me be careful it is biblical it's it is there yes hell is mentioned now let me also say this there are a couple of words used in the bible that are translated as hell by the way there's no word hell in the bible in the sense of english word hell there's no english word hell problem with us is when we think of the word hell for us the pictures already we have drawn some pictures of it you know people screaming very often that is coming from the medieval period of dante's you know inferno things like that the old testament we have the word sheol which is where everybody goes that's a place of the death everybody goes down that's a picture okay so in the new testament the equivalent of that is probably hades which is a greek idea again a place where the dead go but jesus uses in the gospels gehenna so this word is translated as hell in the new testament gehenna now i know some translations even for hades is translated as hell but uh, modern translation generally like to use the word hell or use the word hell only for gehenna now this word gehenna or hell is found only 12 times in the whole new testament and in the first three gospels is not found in john and then once in uh, james chapter 3 verse 6 now i was surprised when i looked for this word it's not there in john it is not found in the book of acts gehenna it is not found in any of the letters of paul yes there is talk about punishment and wrath yes and in the book of revelation there is no mention of hell very interesting so i don't know whether we use hell as a motivation to preach the gospel we don't find that anywhere in the book of acts but hell is a reality Jesus warned and mostly warned disciples also but especially you know the the religious leaders that they will end up in Gehenna and Gehenna in the time of Jesus was a place outside of Jerusalem where terrible things had happened in the past it was like a rubbish dump so he's using like you'll be thrown into the dustbin you'll be wasted you don't want that end so hell has its own way to be understood in the context of Jesus' time, Gehenna. Now, hell has also become a little controversial topic. And so, 
what i would say is the bible clearly speaks about the reality of gehenna of a, of what we, in english we are stuck with the word hell the reality of hell however what the bible is that this is where the debate comes what is the nature of this hell what is the duration of this hell what is the purpose of this hell especially if it is not mentioned in all the places in the bible all the time so this is where evangelical christians have disagreed friends now some people think no that there should not be a disagreement i respect their view but uh, there is a book that came out some time ago uh, actually two versions of that one came out many years ago and one recently four views on hell put out by zondervan okay so and these are all evangelicals who hold this view four different views on hell nobody uh, questions the fact yes hell is there mentioned but what is it what is the nature purpose duration etc so this is where i think we may disagree but the bible says when god's kingdom comes there is judgment and we need to be watching out for that yes in the new testament uh, did jesus uh, teach us to give tithes and what is the kind <laughs> of giving uh, taught in the new testament here is a pastor asking me and this is an important question and uh, i i have worked through this question a lot i have struggled with questions sometimes i am asked the question should we give tithes by the way the meaning tithe as we should understand is 10% so do we give 10% before taxes or after taxes and that's a good question to ask right uh, especially in places where there are heavy taxes and i say let's look at the gospel let's look at jesus the only place in the gospels where jesus talked about tithes i think is matthew 23 23 in matthew and also that same verse is found i think in luke he tells the pharisees you are giving tithes right but you are missing out the more important thing so giving tithes alone is not everything but giving 10% is a symbolic gesture this started off long ago even in the time of abraham from the loot he got when he went to rescue lot he gave to melchizedek right so giving 10% is good but if you ask me should christians give tithes i would say 10% yes if you can give that or little bit more to your own church and i want to say that all of us must belong to a church even if you are listening to preachers all over the place i believe in being part of a local congregation so i think whichever congregation we are part of some of us may say i don't like the pastor i don't like the people i want to tell them don't worry they also may not like you <laughs> so whichever church we choose to be with we should support that and i think giving 10% or close to that is a good habit but then i i have a little rider on that i think of that as kindergarten but we don't want to stay in kindergarten all our all our life so the moment you give 20% you are not giving tithes anymore because tithing is 10% you don't have 20% tithe right and so what did we read in luke's gospel when he said i'll give half to the poor jesus didn't say give tithe or john the baptizer said what those who have two give away one so we need to grow in generosity like god gives i know of people who have given 50% 70% 90% who give they have chosen to live a life like that amazing why not so i would say yes give at least 10% to your church and then you can give 10% to something else another 10% to something else another 10% to something else why not uh, moving to the next question in the old testament levites were totally dedicated in the temple but in the new testament uh, do we have a full time ministry or how do we look at ministry as a part time or a full time ministry okay. i think now we have kind of moving out of the gospels place and maybe going into places like 
the writings of Paul and Book of Acts and things like that. Yeah, I, I think the word ministry itself, we need to understand, is an English word which means service. That's why, because of the British tradition, we have departments of the government called Ministry of Health and Ministry of Education, Ministry of Defense. So, ministry means service. And what we see is what God wanted for the Israel also. You are a royal priesthood. The whole nation was to be a priest. If so, the same, 1 Peter 2.9, all people of God are called to be priests to God. What does that mean? That they are mediators between God and other people. They take the blessing of God that God's intention was to bless the whole world through all the people of God. So I think of the word ministry as all the people of God are called to serve God. Every one of us. Now, traditionally we use the word ministry for church related. So you are a pastor. I am a pastor, Bible college teacher. We are in ministry. But the school teacher teaching physics in school or English or the person who is a lorry driver cannot be in the ministry. I find that, sorry to say, unbiblical. There are specific callings. So I may be called to be a pastor, but I can also be called to be a teacher. I can mention so many examples of people who I know who have served in two vocations, two callings. So this idea of full-time, part-time is, I would say, unbiblical. It's not in the Bible. For example, Paul will say, 1 Thessalonians 2.9, he will say, we worked night and day so that we will not be a burden to you. What was he doing? According to Acts 18.3, some kind of leather work. So if he's working night and day, is Paul in full-time ministry? Yes. All of us are called to be. God may call us to be a homemaker. God may call us to be a school teacher. God may call us to be a taxi driver. God may call us to be a business person. God may even call us to be a politician. Yeah, I, mean, I know it's difficult to think of that. Why not? God can call us for any calling. And so all of us should be full-time serving the Lord. Some of us in one vocation or the other. One of my best friends is a businessman. You know, and he passionately, his, his calling in life is to serve Jesus. But he's a businessman. His knowledge of the Bible is fantastic, better than some pastors. How come? He's in full-time ministry. All of us are called to serve God. We have only one life, Pastor Shine. And I'm getting older and I'm realizing even more <laughs> that I have few more years. I don't know how long. So all of us are called to serve God fully. If you're called to be a school teacher, let us be the best school teacher possible. My mother was one. My father was one. So we are called to serve God Yes, some of us will also be called to serve as pastors, teachers, evangelists, apostles. Let us do that also. Thank you, Pastor. We have come to the final question <laughs> of the day. Yeah, it's uh, been a long time. Yeah, but thank you so much. You have brought in your 40 years of learning, Pastor, and given the answers so simple for us all to understand. And we really appreciate what you have done today. Coming back to the final question. Can you please touch on the second coming of Jesus Christ? This question is from one Mr. Thomas Abraham from Bangalore. I'm going to touch uh, the second coming. Yes. Uh, if you remember that little video clip that uh, uh, we showed the, the group and the line diagrams there, very simple. The two vertical lines represent the kingdom that has come in Jesus and the kingdom that will be finally ushered in with the second coming, the parousia. Parousia is just a simple Greek word which means the coming. But Christians like to talk about, like the coming of the emperor or any dignitary. This is when finally the king will finally come and usher in the kingdom. So that is clearly taught in the gospels. Clearly taught in the gospels. The coming of the son of man. Now, when will that be? Interestingly, Jesus said, the Son of Man doesn't know. The Father knows. But I found it very interesting that 
while Jesus as a son of man on earth said he doesn't know many of us preachers seem to know when Jesus is coming how do I know because when I was a young man I have given out tracts which said what will happen in 1982 I said the planets will come in line so before that the rapture will take place and Jesus will come then after that it went on another dear one wrote a book called 88 reasons why the rapture will take place in 1988 and he was a you know a NASA scientist Edgar Wisenant of course when it didn't happen he wrote another one 89 reasons why 1989 so we keep you know missing the mark and point here that Jesus has promised that he will come back again and by the way all sections of the church worldwide in the early creeds many churches they read the Apostles Creed he shall come again to judge the living and the dead all of us believe in that all Christians must believe should believe and Jesus will come now when I don't know but I like to tell myself as I have seen in my short life that many people who preach Jesus is coming before they will die or whatever they have gone to be with Jesus so the chances are some of us may go to be with Jesus before he comes to to bring in his earth so we must all be ready either we go to be with him or he comes and he ushers in the kingdom so the gospels clearly talk about that Jesus, Jesus will come back again and we wait for that great time but because we know he's coming back we live in such a way that is in continuity with the kingdom values of God kingdom will come in all its fullness but we need to start living kingdom life now as we anticipate his coming in glory may his kingdom come that is will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you Pastor Jacob Churian for this wonderful time. We really appreciate you taking time and coming. Thank you Pastor fact, Shine for giving me the privilege. Thank you. In fact you are unwell and <laughs> in spite of your physical pain that you are going through you could take time and come Pastor. We truly appreciate your, your heart to serve the Lord, to teach us the word of God and sitting in your classes has been a life transforming experience for me and God really bless you to teach many 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 people regarding the kingdom of God dear friends we are so glad that we could have this session on the gospels uh, may God richly bless you for and enable you to learn more from the kingdom of uh, from the word of God uh, we have seminars from the gospel of Mark and Luke and other teachings of Pastor Jacob Cherian in this channel so you may go and watch those this session will remain in this YouTube so you can go back and listen to this uh, session and you can also refer others to come and learn from the good news in the gospel it has been a joy to have you thank you pastor once again for your time uh, God richly bless you we will come back again God willing next time with another session until then God richly bless you. Good night.